welcome back everybody. So today we speak with the lovely and hugely experienced coach Kevin Renshaw. Kev actually started out as a swimmer himself and reached senior national level in a sport that would later take him down the coaching route where he really found his passion. Having coached since 94, he became a British team coach in 2004 and has so many achievements to his name. He's had swimmers at multiple Commonwealth Games where in 2018 he was also the head coach of the England team. He's taken swimmers to world champs all around the world and coached Joanne Jackson to three world medals and not one but two world records. He also guided David Davis to an Olympic silver medal in 2008. So today we talk with him about some of those journeys and getting the absolute best out of each individual athlete that he works with and what some of the character traits are that he sees in these successful athletes. How would he compare the three Olympic Games that he's coached at, those being Beijing, London and Rio, and how he's learnt from and taken on board wise words spoken to him from his colleagues and coaching friends. Thanks for listening today, guys. We really hope that you enjoy hearing from our guest, Kevin Renshaw. All right. Hi, Kev. How are you doing? Thanks for coming on today, man. Good, mate. Good to see you. You two looking magnificent. <laughs> you oh, yeah. too, Kev. You too. Try really nice best. to see you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kev, you've been um, coaching in Britain. You've got a wealth of experience um, coaching all sorts of different athletes. What is it that got you into coaching in the first place? Uh, by accident. Oh, really? So. Yeah, so um, I, I I swam when I was younger, uh, just, you know, like I was a decent national level swimmer. I swam a lot of national senior finals. I won a few age group medals and stuff like that. And then when I stopped swimming, um, uh, I did what a lot of young people do, yeah? I just got a group of friends and went out every Friday, Saturday, Sunday, <laughs> Monday, and, and stuff like that. Um, and then I, I was coached all the way through my, my own swimming career by my dad. And uh, who also coached Dave McNulty, right. Okay. All right. And after uh, probably about four or five years after I stopped swimming and I'd never set foot anywhere near a swimming pool, uh, my dad took took ill. He had a few issues with his heart, and he needed to uh, he, he needed to like kick back for a, a period of six nine months, whatever. And he said, uh, "Would you would you come and temporarily?" do this coaching lark for me <laughs> and uh, so I did so I did and then um, I, I loved it I, I loved it I loved like my social life that I was having but I, I loved this and and uh, when he then then kind of came back I, I was like yeah I probably want to probably want to be a bit more involved in this um well I can't I can't just usurp my dad here like you know that's not, <laughs> not, not a way of doing this so um, I, uh, I went from coaching a club for six, nine months to I, I got a job working at uh, a small program. Actually, it was a decent program, Gateshead and Wickham in, in Tyneside. And I was coaching the 10 and 11 year olds. Right. right? I, did, I did that like for um, probably eight or nine months. Then I got the chance uh, to, to be head coach at Newburn Swimming Club. You would probably know that one, Joe Newburn. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, that the pool that we used at Newburn was the pool that uh, Ryan Livingston now operates out of, because um, the, the the old Newcastle City pool closed down. But anyway, we did uh, did, did a pretty good job at Newburn, and I was there about four years, um, and then my dad had finally like I I'm retired, and uh, so there's a job job going in in my hometown. Um, but but by this time, my brother has also been starting to uh, do some coaching, assistant coaching for uh, for my dad in in there. And anyway, we're both like, yeah, yeah, I want the job. Anyway, give it to me, <laughs> not my brother. <laughs> my brother is coach there now. Right. Um, okay. Oh, great. <laughs> you just have to wait and have to get the role. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and so, like, uh, I, I, I went back to my hometown, Chesley Street, uh, started coaching there. Uh, I started doing a pretty decent job with a bunch of uh, uh, 
mainly females from us, one of which was Steph Proud, who you both both know, yeah, yeah. when she was 11 years old. And there was a, uh, another couple of really good girls there. Uh, we, we went, like, t- within two years, we actually won top, top club at uh, national age groups. And this Whoa. is like, a, it's only 80 members of Chesley Street Summit Club at the time. Uh, yeah. But it was them, that, that little group of nucleus of girls, really. And one girl that had come with me from New Bern as well, because she kind of lived halfway between the two, so an easy transition. But yeah, we did we had a, did a, a pretty good job. Uh, Steph was coming on and incredibly well. Um, 2003, she won European Juniors when she was 14. Well, she won Youth Olympic, European Youth Olympics the year before that as well. Um, as a 13-year-old, um, this girl called Stephanie Johnson made the European Junior team in 20, 2004, and Danielle Burry. And I think they in in two years they won like 14 medals at European Juniors between them. Wow. And at that point, I was doing stuff for I was kind of I was I actually had a full time job as well. I should chuck that one in as well. <laughs> so I, I had a full time job as a construction engineer with with a whole bunch of different uh, building companies, like the big house builders, Barrett and Persimmon and people like that. Uh, so, God, my life was... <laughs> busy. <laughs> you know, yeah, busy. And then on top of that, um, at the time, Bill Sweetnam and John Atkinson were leading up British Summit. And, and uh, they, they'd approached me of like doing, uh, getting more involved in the, the podium potential programme that British Summit were running. And I had head coached a number of their ca- the camps and stuff like that. Um, and I guess through just through doing a decent job, doing those camps, um, Bill, Bill nominated me back in, must have been early 2004 for UK Sports Elite Coach Programme, which okay. was a multi-sport coaching programme uh, to develop the next bunch of, you know, elite coaches it was pretty experimental back then we were the first year we didn't really know what we were going into but part of the deal with this each individual sport was that uh, the uh, they, they were to be employed by the governing body so I got accepted onto this program and obviously then British women had to employ me but British women didn't really know what to do with me <laughs> <laughs> so first they're like well we've employed them but you know we've only got Loughborough and we, we don't there was no national centres or anything really back then yeah. um, so the first thing that I did was they, they sent me out to the offshore centre out in Australia and yeah. I was meant to be there for about six weeks to help uh, the coach out there and to get a little bit of experience while they figured out what they were going to do with me but after about four weeks the, the coach that was out there went uh, went on sick and he never come back so i was there for six months <laughs> um, so was that at, at t- tss tss yeah on the gold like the coast i mean chris nesbitt yeah yes before oh, chris nesbitt yeah right I see. so um yeah so i had i remember when i was actually leaving to come back for good to come back yeah, I met Chris in the in the airport and talked to her. He was coming there for for his interview for the job, not for oh, okay. to take the job. For his interview, and we had a little bit of a chat about some of the things that he, you know, need, might need to be aware of. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then I then I when I came back, it was like, okay, uh, you, you're in Loughborough. Um and right. so I, really it was. I think it was March two thousand and five that I landed in Loughborough, and I was. Uh, really, like mainly assistant coach to Ian Turner for for the next two years. Um, so it was Benny, and then me mainly working with uh, with Ian Turner. And then in two thousand and seven, um, Bill Sweden decided, okay, we, we we're going to go with three group three groups here. And then uh, two, so two thousand and seven, I had my own group. And Dave Davis joined, and then yeah, a few a, a wild roller coaster. Um, nine years till 2016 when I then decided a, li- a little change was needed. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my potted, hi- potted history of caring <laughs> swimming. <laughs> yeah, but it's great. It's, it's varied as well. Like you say, you've got age group, you've got senior athletes, you've been out to different countries and coach. So 
the amount of uh, sort of different types of athletes that you've seen and worked with and coaching uh, staff that you've worked with as well um, is, is immense really, which is great when you're building that coaching knowledge, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. Those, um, those athletes, is there any particular character traits you would look for when you first see those young athletes? Like obviously you need them to be hard working and stuff like that, but is there anything else that you would identify a young age or a senior age that you're looking out for that you know they're going to be sort of invested into what, what you like to do? Um, I mean, I know attitude covers all a whole range of stuff, but there's there's yeah. an attitude that you wanna <laughs> you wanna see. Um, you, you can still be successful, I guess, to a, to a point where they, yeah, you know, not not amazing attitude. And I have had one or two of them to work with, <laughs> and, and we've got uh, decent results out of them. Um, but I think attitude is a, is a huge, huge thing. Having the having the right, and it doesn't always, always every second of the day have to be a positive attitude. But it needs to be an attitude of of, of uh, if it's if you, if you have days where it's not about I can do, you, you you you've got to have you've got to be able to replace that with I'm still going to fight. You know, I'm going to be a fighter. I'm going to. I'm going to be driven. I'm going to be tough. I'm going to. There's a whole list of stuff that comes under yeah. attitude. It's, it's not like just one one trait. Um, I, and I think like to, as a as a successful swimmer, that that's the 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 main thing for me. Other than when you then start getting into obviously genetics, yeah. yeah, yeah. We you know are, are you going to be tall enough? Uh, are, are you well? If you are you are you fast fast twitch athlete to become an Amy, or are you a slow twitch to become a Joe? <laughs> Oi, <laughs> saying that really tongue in cheek, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you were apparently um, your groups tended to be the distance athletes. That seemed to be your your niche. You seem to uh, you like like you say Dave Davis and uh, even. Yeah. Steph Proud, you mentioned before she was like 400 medley and some of those tough events. How come you see? Did you gravitate towards them, or did they gravitate towards you? How did that come about? Well, um, when I came off deck in 16, um, before I answer you, I'm going to take you somewhere first. Um, so when I came off deck, deck in 16. A couple of people had, had, had said that to me because I'd, ne I'd never really thought about thought of it that way. Right. But like a couple of people said that to me, that, that same thing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you kind of go away. And now that I'm not coaching, I have more reflective times. You know, I've got more yeah. time. When you're coaching, you just fall on. You know, <laughs> you're just full on with the doing of what, what you're doing. And I started to reflect on this. Um, and um, so I, I did make some little... And then when you, you put that in the... Uh, the, the message uh, that you sent to us, I thought about that again, and I've just made some, knocked some things up. And the, the, the list that I come up with, it was 25 things in my career at Loughborough in middle distance events where I either won international medals or broke British records or swam in world finals. Yeah. And there was not that many in distance swim events. <laughs> so I've actually been, I've actually been more successful is a middle distance coach than what is it? Well, I was as a distance coach, but I think because um, we, we're not a nation where we've got lots of people doing well in distance, so I think it was very noticeable for me um, that I always had a pocket of them. It was never yeah. just. I mean, them early days, even when with in, with Dave in two thousand and seven into eight, Dan Dan was coming through really well then. Yeah. And then, you know, it was just Dan in 11 and 12, but then by 12, Jack Benella joined in 13, um, Caleb Hughes and Toby Robinson joined, and then in 15, Timmy Shuttleworth joined. And at that point, in 15 through to 16, you had all five of them guys at once in the, yeah. the programme. So it started a... It definitely looked like it was a distance programme there. Then. Um, but, you know, I, I also thought about... Um, so I, uh, David, I think, broke the British record in the 800 with when he was with me. Okay, the 800. 
No one else 800 and above. I've not, I've not coached anyone to break a record 800 and above, but I've had about 10 400 and below, including yeah. 100. Includes We're the 100 the breaststroke out of Molly. Oh, right, Molly. Yeah, Molly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Molly Shaw caught 100 breaststroke. Yeah. Um, and and we, actually, going way back to 2008, I coached Craig Gibbons as well. He went, <laughs> he went 49 6. He, coached, yeah. he went 49 6 at the Olympic trials in 2008, and that was the sixth fastest ever by a British swimmer. Wow. Ooh. So, like, I, what I think I am, because I've also had, in, er, earlier in my career, prior to Molly coming, you need to just stick the freestyle and medley the tough events because you, you'll not be able to coach someone like a, a breaststroker. Now, what, what I think about um, the sport and where I've talked with Armager about this years and years ago, what I developed as, as a philosophy for coaching was that I train an event and I coach a person. Right, yeah. Okay? That's pretty simplified version. When I train an event, what I what I do is I go, I'm gonna find out everything I need to know to be able to train that event really well. Yeah. And I'll find that out from whoever I need to find it out from as well. Yeah. So what are the physiological requirements of that event? So when Molly come in, I never coach the breaststroke. I mean, in fact, you mentioned Steph Proud as a good form of medley swimmer. But she, she, she got away with it because she was a, obviously an outstanding backstroke from her. Her yeah. breaststroke was hideous and I could <laughs> never fix it. Never fix it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so then, then, then with, uh, like I say, with Molly, it was like just really studying the technical side of, uh, of the event. It was looking at what her limitations were because Molly had, Molly had actually plateaued for about two years prior to coming come into us. Mm. So what I'm saying there is like uh, that I think I could coach anyone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but, but there's certainly a, a, a type of person that would gravitate towards me. The fact is what I'm saying there as well, that's not like a, an arrogance level. It's just a, I think I could coach anyone. Um, but not everyone, because everybody's got a coach that suits them, but not everyone is, you know, so even, even as a 1500 coach, if that's how you saw me, there'll be people that would just not click with me. And I wouldn't be the right person, even if it's in that event. We've right. all got them. Yeah. There's no one coach can coach everyone in a, in a particular event. Don't, yeah. I just don't think that exists because no. the, like the relationship and the, and all that is is so important, isn't it? As, as you guys know, the relationship yeah, is is massive. Yeah, definitely. I mean, have you have you had those situations before where you've realised it's not quite clicking, and you suggest maybe try this, maybe try that? Because I, I feel like a lot of coaches, like you say, they're going to come across athletes where the event for them fits. You know, they've they've coached it before, or that they want. To, to do that event or whatever it is, but coach athlete relationship just doesn't quite click for whatever reason because everyone's different. Yeah. So have you come across those situations and how do you deal with those if you have? Yeah, well, um, one, one the, 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 what I talked about before, I talked about Steph Proud and she, she was with me a long time and me and her started to uh, like really get on each other's nerves probably oh, right. at a period in Loughborough. We'd been together for a long time, and and where we'd had been kind of uh, r really cool together, uh, it just wasn't. It got to a point where it just wasn't working. So, um, and and I guess a little bit of it, 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 it to some extent, it happened by accident. But um, I went to the World uh, Swim Coaches Conference in Florida, and then after after that was finished, I then went to Gators, and I spent a week at uh, Florida Gators. And I thought, this, this, this is the environment for her. And right. I spoke with uh, Greg Troy while I was there and Martin Willoughby. And then as soon as I got back, uh, I, meet, I spoke with Ian Armager. And then we spoke with Steph. Steph and, uh, and she was like, I've always quite fancied going to the States. And I was like, oh, you should have, you probably should have mentioned that to me. <laughs> you could have. Yeah. But, 
But, you know, we, we facilitated that and it was the, absolutely the right thing for her. Now, I think um, what, what was so good about that was we, me and her had got to a point where we were just like this all the time. But I think because I did the right thing for her, she's one of my best friends now. Yeah. You know, like she, she, she'll FaceTime me every week at the minute. Like we meet up and go out for dinner. And like, she's just a really, really good friend because I did right. the right thing by her. Yeah. yeah so the message is if you butt heads, ship them off to a different continent. <laughs> 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 <That's good>. Yes. <laughs> No, I think that's and I've obviously had, you know, I've had fallouts with swimmers before as well. Like, you know, you, you can you can just get into the wrong place, uh, and it's very it's very very difficult in a situation like a national centre when you're coaching eight or nine people, and um, you t you two guys would would, would understand this, um, but a lot of, a lot of people are very very demanding of a coach's time at that end of the sport, at the top yeah. end of the sport. And what's really difficult is if you, you focus on one or two here, these ones start, what's, yeah. what, what's going on here? And, and uh, yeah, so I've, I, I've, I said yesterday on the Zoom call that I did to a, to a whole bunch, of, I think nearly 80 coaches on there, I said I've made a lot of mistakes in my career, loads of them. But I've, uh, I, I've generally learned from them. And I think that's what's really, really important is to okay. learn. And that's the same for, for swimmers. You'll make a lot of mistakes, but you've got to, you've got to learn from them. And uh, I mean, you, you're asking about like uh, little fallouts with swimmers. Like, you, you, we're, we're all good friends with Liam and Caitlin, and I coached Caitlin for a few years. And then that, that, that kind of didn't, didn't work out. And we were, pro Caitlin and I, pretty cold with each other for a couple of years. But like what I got from uh, from that, well, we we made up. Obviously, um, we we were at a, a wedding a year ago, yeah. um, and uh, but what what I got from that was the type of person and type of personality that Caitlin was. All of the things I got wrong, I could apply to another swimmer who had a similar personality and a similar kind of thing a few years later. Yeah, and and I didn't yeah. make the mistakes, and I got a good result out of her. Yeah, absolutely. Is there any like um, advice you could give then to like maybe coaches or athletes to avoid some of those mistakes you said to learn? Like, what are some of those things that you would take away that would help certain types of individuals? Because the thing is, when like you say, you've got eight, nine, ten athletes in one group at that top end, you're going to get some spiky characters. Like that's that spikiness or whatever you want to call it. That's what makes them successful athletes in a lot of circumstances so you're going to get some big strong-willed characters and the same with the coaches they're going to be strong-willed you'll be confident in what they're doing so that's sometimes where those conflicts can arise i assume um so what what could you what advice would you have on that or what did you learn i think um i think in 2015 14 fifth back into 14 15 and 16 i probably coached better on deck than I had done at any point in my career, even yeah. though it wasn't as successful as what I was in 2009. And, and a large part of that was how I had kind of changed my perspective and, and demeanor based on the fact that I'd just had a little girl. Right. So that was a large part of it, was wow. my, my, my life became a little bit more of, that's what's really important, okay. really, really important. This yeah. is really important, but that is everything. Yeah. And it just gave me a little bit more uh, perspective. It, it, yeah. it allowed me to be a bit more chilled out about stuff, and I didn't fight, fight battles that I fought before. But another real important thing then as well was by then I was working uh, with Dave Hemmings. Dave Hemmings had come in as, as my assistant. Now, at no point in my career did I ever have an assistant coach on deck working with me at the same time, right? Never. Um, so when Dave came along, and Dave's a really great bubbly character, fantastic bubbly character. We, we did virtually everything, um, even keeping discipline happened then with humour. 
Right. So you 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 know you could tell someone off, give them a kick <laughs> up the ass, but do it do it in a much more humorous way because me and him could keep each other in a in a really really good place. Um, and I, and I, I think that's important. I got asked yesterday what about pieces of advice I would give give. Uh, I'm going to have to figure out how I say this because I'm going to have to use a different word to what I used yesterday. <laughs> uh, what, what pieces of advice would you give your younger self? And one of them uh, was not to be such a... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, how, how would I put it? The vocabulary at North East is limited. <laughs> yeah, exa exactly. Uh, yeah, not to be so up yourself. Right, I guess yeah, okay. is, a, is, a, is a right way of, uh, of saying it. Got to kind of, I guess, well. yeah, yeah, and just always remember why you're doing it. But it, do, it does get hard, particularly like you know, if you if you are managing a uh, a group that is really, really is at the top end of the sport, and all of them are. And and I think you know, there's there's pro pluses and minuses to having these these small groups. And sometimes there's a massive negative about coaching a small group in that, you know, you, you, it, it can become just way, way too intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If the I mean, group is I, too small. Yeah. I mean, I can, yeah, I can vouch for that. I mean, I, I was um, in a group of four at one point for <laughs> around a year. And like, although we all got on, there is points where if one person out of those four isn't having such a, well, five with your coach there, you know, isn't having such a great day it can have a significant impact on the rest of the group i mean you, yeah. you said obviously about uh using humor for you know discipline purposes and things like that and that's one way that you kind of um get around that without anything getting too serious um but with those smaller squads maybe or even with the larger squads where like you say you've got a focus of athletes that are you know looking at different goals to some of the other the rest of the squad maybe how do you kind of build and maintain a squad dynamic? We've spoken a bit about like the coach athlete dynamic. How about the dynamics between teammates? Do you try and have an impact on that as a coach? I do. And I, I, I always try to have an impact on that. I try to get people to understand that we're in this together and that we're allies. Uh, you know, that, that no, we're an individual sport, but we've got to have team uh, aspects to how we go about things and that's that that includes in a in god i think at one point i had three swimmers in in my group in 2011 i think i had three swimmers in 2011 um and and you just got to get them to understand everyone to understand that we're all in this together and doesn't matter if you swim in different events you're still going to be getting help and support from each other and um one of the most difficult relationships I, I ha ever had to manage was between two of my distance swimmers. Um, uh, yeah, which which was was really difficult. One had no respect whatsoever for the other one, despite the other one was way better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, we got there. We managed we managed to keep the peace generally, but it was a. It was the, the older, the older one was able to just, yeah, whatever. You probably know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, again, everyone's so different. And, and when you do get, like you say, they were some in a similar event. So when you get then rivalry on top of that within a group, a, a group in particular, yeah. then, yeah, things can become difficult at, at times for sure. But I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you've you've had a wealth of experience. Like you say, you'd see yourself more as maybe the middle distance type coach. Um, but you've middle distance up. Middle distance <laughs> up. Okay. Yeah. Well, middle apart distance from Molly and Craig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've I mean you've had so much experience at um so you've been to three Olympic Games, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Beijing being your first one. So I mean what were those yeah. experiences like for you being being there as a coach? Oh, excellent. I mean, like the first one, really, I, um, um, it, it was a new, brave new world for me. I, I, up to that point, the Olympics in Beijing, I'd never even been to a world championships. 
right. or or a European Championships or a Commonwealth Games. Oh. Everything I had done up to that point. Actually, I had been to a Europeans, but I only got there, only went to the Europeans in 2008 because David was pre-selected for the Olympics and we swam the Europeans instead of the Olympic trials. I think Europeans was on about three weeks before the Olympic trials. So we right. went and swam the Europeans. So it was kind of, yeah, wasn't really a team selection. I think there was only about a dozen people in total went because I think we had some relays to qualify yeah, to the Europeans that year. Um, I think one of the girls really has had to qualify. Um, so, yeah, there was a very, I think Liam went as well, uh, but it wasn't, wasn't many at all. It might not have even been a dozen. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a, a, a totally new experience for, for, for me. I think I handled it pretty well that, that year. Um, I remember a great piece of advice that I got from uh, Coach Dave Haller. Right. Dave Haller, in fact, he, he gave it to a, to a number of us because there was a few first-timers on that, that team. And he said, just remember, guys, this is the day before competition, I think it was. And he was like, just remember, guys, walk slowly. <laughs> so, Take it all in. Don't run around. Yeah, don't run around. Don't lose your head. Just keep it all walk slowly and that it, and sounds it was, like it, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, but it was it was an absolute masterpiece uh, uh, piece of advice it, it was yeah. it was exactly what it, what I needed to hear mm. um and, and Beijing was weird for, like, so going back to what kind of coach was I and right my group in the Beijing Olympics so I had David who was doing the 15 and the 10k Right, yeah. And I had Dean Mulwain, my own swimmer. Then I had Robbie Rennick, 200 meter swimmer. Who then? Then I, I I had seven, and I'm trying, and I'm missing one. So David, Dean, Robbie Rennick. But I had Simon Burnett, Adam Brown, and Ben Hutton in my group. The pure sprinters. The pure sprinters, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and because somebody had decided that. Um, Simon actually spent about six, seven weeks with me in Loughborough prior to the Olympics. He'd come, right. we'd come back for a, we had a meet in Liverpool as a prep meet, so we came back like about a week before that and then just stayed in Britain right through the Olympics. So I had Simon all, all up, and I'm missing someone, Andy Hunter. Okay, oh, yeah. I think I had Andy. Two, four hundred, hundred, two hundred, four hundred. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it Andy? <laughs> anyway, I had seven swimmers in my group, and so like, and it and it varied from the fifty to the ten k. I mean, yeah, you know. something much more varied. No, really. no, absolutely. I mean, one of the things uh, I I think uh, I remember coming out of you know David David was in had a shot at a medal in the fifteen hundred. He'd medal four years earlier, getting a medal in that event four years between them is, is pretty tough anyway, but he had a really good chance of it. He finished fifth. Um, he was bitterly disappointed, um, but we all also knew that he, he had an incredibly good shot at, at the 10K yeah. and, uh, and and possibly, you know, possibly a great shot of winning it. Um, he'd already swam the world's open water that year and came second there by a fingertip finish there. Um, and I remember like the, the sports science people telling me that, right, he, now that he's finished the 15, he needs to do this, do that, do the other, in terms of what he needs to do training-wise. Right. And I decided David needed two days off. Right. <laughs> well, why, because, why like, are you not and, listening to the, the science? What, what did you see? I, I saw uh, somebody who uh, just needed to get his thoughts together. To get his head right and to get at ease with himself and, right, and refocus, and yeah. um, and that that that's what we went with. We give him give him a couple of days off, and uh, I think it was two days off. Me and David agreed, and then but I'd say, I think I'd said to him like, you know, you, you come and tell me when you when you're ready to have a swim. Yeah, and then yeah. we got moved out of the village up to to where the Olympics uh, the event was at. It was at, at the rowing. Uh, Regatta Lake, and um, 
beautiful hotel. We just chilled out around there and uh, did a couple of pool sessions and then swam in the lake a couple of days. Uh, yeah. And he got a silver medal there, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's that's an amazing turnaround. Like you say, he was bitterly disappointed after uh, the results of the fifteen hundred, even though he he'd done amazingly. Fifth in an Olympic final is incredible, uh, but like yeah. was aiming for something slightly different. So yeah, it's tough, and it it is interesting because I, I was listening to a podcast um, with Poolside Pass yesterday with James Gibson, and he was talking about yeah. the paper and saying that. He believes that the head, the mental side of it, is probably more important than, than the scientific side of it. Now, I, I love the scientific side, don't get me wrong, but I feel like there are points where the head is, is a lot stronger than, than the body in some cases. And you do have to yeah. really take that on board as a coach, I think. And like you say, kind of just read the app and see what it is that they they need at that point and obviously it worked because it turned him round and came to a silver medal in his next event a few days later so it was obviously uh, the right yeah. thing to do yeah and i totally agree with james on that i think you know we we've, we've all been there we we know what the elite end of the sport is when they, when a bunch of guys line up for an olympic final they're nearly always as fit as each other yeah aren't they yeah. They're nearly yeah. always as fit as each other. The determining yeah. factor nearly always is in here. And I, I think uh, I kind of have this little rule of thumb that I, that, I, that, I, that I kind of say to remind myself of, but I do tell other coaches that. I think like a, a 90% physical preparation with 100% in there, total belief in yourself will deliver results. But I'm not sure with the other way around, Will. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure at all. No, that makes you can sense. be as fit as you want, but if you're if you're if you don't believe you got and I, I I'm sure that Foggy would be okay with me saying this. I I I believed that Foggy should have won a medal in London in the 10K, but I don't think Foggy ever thought he could. Right. You know, and he fi he finished fifth in yeah. London. But, yeah. Uh, I really believed he could have won a medal. He he didn't think he could. I don't I don't think it's not something we dwell on loads. But uh, I don't think he really believed he could. Is that something you so, realise now in hindsight, or did you realise that at the time? You know, leading in. I I, I realised it probably going in. Yeah, I think I always did because he was always quite. Uh, yeah, I do own water because. Kev wants me to rather than <laughs> <laughs> he, he, yeah he, you know Dan was it, it obviously he was a good good enough swimmer he was he got himself in great shape he was he, uh, I think he's smaller than you isn't he okay. he's, he's always the shortest man in the room isn't he oh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to upset him but yeah I, I, I don't <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just how he's miserable he's not was. the tallest yeah. guy. No, he's not, but he's probably still a bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm not particularly tall. <laughs> yeah, you did have a but, he's, uh, yeah. he's but, that, but he had a great mentality. Sorry, Joe. No, I was say you did have a point where, like, your squad. I remember you coming in and saying, it "Looks like the Shire in here." <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, like Pavoni, and I remember you taking the mick out of them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, Dan, when he swam, in, he swam in the Olympic final in the 15 in London as well. He was eight. Um, and I, you know, I, I rack my brain to think of anyone. I mean, he was five foot ten. And, uh, you know, I, I am a, I'm, like, I'm a student of the sport. And I cannot think of anyone other than Eric Vent, the American swimmer, who would be under six foot that has swam in the Olympic 1500 final. Certainly not in the last 20, 30 years. I might be wrong, but I can't think of any. Yeah. And I have looked at all of those finals. They're wow. generally really big guys. Um, Foggy got the absolute most out of himself. And, you know, like, if we talk, talk about, like, what success as a coach. So David wins, wins an Olympic medal. Joanne won three world medals, broke two world records. But getting the absolute most you can out of a guy who doing something that shouldn't be done, that, that's really successful. Yeah. And I guess one of the, you know, one of the problems I had with the whole 
coming out of London thing of, oh, it was a big failure. Um, somebody like Dan coming fifth and eighth in, in freestyle events, long access strokes where you need to be really big was a million miles from failure. Mm. And other than me, by the way, nobody thought Dan could win a medal in the, in the 10, uh, 10K before going, other than me. But afterwards, everybody was like, oh, he should have won a medal. Uh, well, that, that's got to kind of be hard for him to take then as well. But I mean, like you say, you, the, the general rule is that the guys are taller and bigger in, in that event. But Foggy kind of was one of the ones that broke that rule. And I think Absolutely. a lot of swimmers, young swimmers, that we always get asked, don't they? Like, oh, what if I'm not tall enough or whatever? And, and I think there's, yeah, there's general guidelines, but there's always anomalies to that rule. And it doesn't mean that it can't happen just because you're not six foot or whatever it is. So I think, yeah, Foggy is a great example of that. Yeah, yeah. But, it, but also there is like the whole, where is the level of success that you can get to? We know, we, yeah. we know that you can't win a medal. It, it, it had Foggy's height, which is why I all, always wanted to push him towards open water. I thought there the height won't matter. We we can do it by being really just being a good swimmer as long as we can get your tactical side of it right, which right. generally didn't happen. Um, but um, you know, we we where the, the, there are some, there'll always be somebody that can book a trend, and you've had Liam on. I mean. You know, yeah. most people probably would have said, like, as a, as a sprint backstroke, eh, Liam wasn't going to be big enough. But he wasn't the only one. You know, Iri, uh, the Japanese yeah. swimmer, he, yeah. he was tiny, wasn't he? Um, yeah. So both, both of those guys got to the very, very top. But I cannot think of a, of a freestyle swimmer, certainly not in the 1500 and probably not in the 50 or the 100 either, or anywhere in between. Generally, they are pretty much giants so the, the long axis strokes freestylers backstrokers uh, yeah. have generally been really big dudes yeah yeah, yeah fair enough. so you've been to so like we mentioned there three olympic games all very yeah. different how would you compare those three olympics and is there anything that you learned moving from beijing into london that you took into rio that you would you know think about if you're telling other coaches into the next one what did you learn from each olympics i know that's quite a, a vague and open question <laughs> but uh there must have been things you learned along the way that you thought that's really important for the next time we do this um yeah uh but like for my own that i, that I kept for myself was about the, the the bit of dave haller was gold dust Right? That's and that's not just yeah. like how you move, how you move around the, the pool. It's not mm. really just yeah, about yeah. don't don't move around quickly. It's about keep everything in perspective. Keep every a low low key to everything. And I think that what I did with Dave of okay, you got two days off now and ignoring the science. Would I have done that had Hala not told me? Mm. Just walk slowly. Maybe I would not. Maybe that was probably the influence that, that did that for me. Uh, I did something similar with, uh, with Dan uh, in 2012. And it was D Dan's taper, because he was obviously at the very back, the last day of the Olympics. He didn't swim at any events until the 1500. Um, he tapered later than everyone. That means he, and he turned up on the Holden camp in Edinburgh, more tired than anyone. Um, and... One of the things I think that I took into that, that I can remember taking that in, we, a lot of the stuff once we started to rest Dan, a lot of the little training pieces we did that we felt were important, we abandoned. Right. If, if it looked like it would have a negative impact on, on him here by it not going well, time, a number of times we just go, it's, not happening it is it may it can just leave it at this point we had a short break as someone came to kev's door but don't worry we get straight back on track talking about the lessons kev learned from each of the olympic games that he went to and how he had the confidence to scrap the plans a few days before david davis's silver medal performance in beijing 
Yeah, I think I did learn that along the way, but but it's it's all about read, reading the athlete and knowing yeah. knowing the person. Yeah. Yes, I you know I I built up a really good relationship with David by that point, and and uh, yeah, I just I you you know you just sometimes a lot of coaching is instinctive as well. It's it, it it's Absolutely. what you're, but it, but even instinct comes from knowledge as well, and. Um, I, th- I guess I just felt like, oh yeah, the the the, the head is not not in any kind of place to go back in a swimming pool right now. Um, so um, you know, and like I said, that 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 carried on. I guess four years later, to to a large extent with Dan, um, him him uh, preparing later than everyone else, him being more fatigued than everyone else uh, because he was right at the very back end of the program. A lot of stuff that we did with with Dan in the in the three week lead up were this isn't going well. I'm going to protect his mentality over yeah. the science, over the physiology. I thought he was in great great shape anyway, physical shape anyway. It was all just coming coming down to protect the um, the, the mentality, and then uh, go by by Rio with uh, with Jack I got a great one in with Jack that I did it's very similar to this so Jack Jack was we were training at the um uh the sports Jack club Bernal, in, uh, Jack, Jack 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 Bernal, yeah um we were training at the sports club in the center of Belo Horizonte it's like uh, 10,000 people were members of this sports club three or four swimming pools down there including a, a 50 meter training pool and uh, we had we had one lane of it to tr- to train. Anyway, Jack morning session, and um, just didn't didn't go well at all. And I was oh, don't don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. We'll just we'll just we'll give this up. Similar to what I was doing with 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 uh, Dan four years earlier. It's like it's not it's not important. We've got four years of work, and Jack was really knocked and upset that he hadn't performed well. He's like a bit wound up that you know I've I've got to try to win an Olympic medal in six days. Whoa. I'm like, yeah, calm down, calm down, whatever. <laughs> and like, he decided, whatever for whatever reason, he decided that um, he's not going to speak to me then. <laughs> so he gets out of the war. And he's in such a bad mood. He doesn't want to speak to me. And we we, we go back. We uh, have a lit. Uh, a second second breakfast and then he goes and has some downtime he comes down for lunch and he's still not speaking to me Mm -hmm. (laughs) what what am i going to do here what's important here and the only thing that was important was to get jack's uh head back in the game head back in it and to be cut and and i thought i I went and sat with him over lunch everybody had disappeared uh, finished and I went and sat with him and I went you weren't happy about that this morning and he's like no no and I said uh, if we were on a training camp in Australia I said and you had like an awful morning session what, what would you what would you then do if you've got like five hours six hours to kill before going back to the to the pool again what would you do he said I'd, I'd go to the beach and sunbathe or something like that. I went, all right, that's what we're doing. <laughs> and we, I said, we don't even have to swim this afternoon. We're going to go back to that sports club. You know, the weather in Brazil, was, in Belo was amazing. They, yeah. You know, the, some of the other pools were leisure pools. There were sunbeds everywhere. And that's what we did. We went down an hour before the training time. And I said, uh, it's entirely up to you whether you take your day to, to, to swim or not. But let's go and have a bit of, let's just go and enjoy a bit of sun, chill out, take a ball down, have a bit mess about with a ball, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we did. We went and sunbathed. And about 20 minutes after the session sort of should have started, he was like, have a really good afternoon. Kev, should we have a little swim? <laughs> and we went and had a swim. And he's like, can we do the set that we were meant to do this morning? I said, no, Jack, there's no need. We, we don't need to catch up on stuff. And he's yeah. like, oh, what should we do? I said, we'll just do some technical stuff. And we just did stroke drills for 30 minutes. And I went, you know what? We've achieved a lot today, mate. Let's, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> got him out. 
and and he was he was great after the rest of the way in from from then. But oh. I guess that was something I, that I really learned is like you know when you're getting into the business end of a major competition, it, it, it's having your headspace clear and being yeah. in a good place. Definitely. I mean, athletes aren't robots. I mean, I know everyone's got a routine and a schedule that you can, through through the rest of the year, you, you kind of need to stick to most of the time. Um, you know, you've got to get that bank of work in, you know. But yeah, like you say, that focus changes a little bit because at the end of the day, they're all human. All the athletes are human. They need different yeah. things from their teammates, from their coach, from their training. So yeah, to get to get them there. So it's important to remember that all that work you've done is the, the really, really important bit. And this is that just little bit on the top, isn't it? To so make sure you yeah, yeah. in speed then, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, why not? Good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and once, once we got down into Rio as well, I mean, pretty much every day me and him went for a walk Some just down on the, you know, we'd get taken to the official bit because it wasn't, you know, you, you were always warned, don't, don't go out walking too much in your in your British tracksuit and stuff like that. So we'd yeah. go down to the venue and we'd just wander off along the beach and back again, having a, having a bit of a chat and what have you. So yeah, yeah, important yeah. stuff. The most important thing. I mean, I guess like all of that training that you do, what you're doing is you're building the engine. Yeah. But like in a, in a car or any mechanical vehicle, nothing works without the gearbox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very yeah. true. I mean, those those three Olympics are all going to be special in their own way. Do you, not necessarily for the swims that your swimmers produced and things like that, but as an experience, like, do you have a preferred? Did you have a favourite? Like a real highlight out of the three? Ah, um, Rio was was different in that I, I was there with the open water team and. Um, where the other two I was with both pool and open water um I was just there with the open water team and uh we didn't stay in the Olympic village so I didn't didn't experience village life but we stayed in a lovely little boutique hotel down on Ipanema beach oh, right. um, tough life <laughs> yeah, it was a tough life I mean the, the food was absolutely amazing um that like because i know there was issues in the village with food and stuff but it was absolutely you know we had, we had a private chef so it was just <laughs> superb um, pretty, um the boa had secured that hotel so um we were in there rowing were in there because the rowan lake was just in the lagoon just up from us uh triathlon came in as we were as we were leaving the day before triathlon came in as well so there was a few uh, sport in there that was a that was a, a very different experience um but just like obviously your first one you, you you're exposed to what actually the size of what an olympic games is it, it is it, it is so huge the villages are huge the the the, the facilities are huge I mean, any any young swimmer now that goes into the London Aquatic Centre and it's their first time, they'll look at it and go, "Oh yeah, this is this is impressive. This is big." But as we know, <laughs> it was a damn sight bigger in twenty in twenty twelve, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it had the wings on it. They, they stripped fifteen thousand seats out of there, didn't they? Yeah, or, 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 or whatever it was. Yeah, so it makes it seem the like the impressive is, one you know now. <laughs> You know, when yeah, I, yeah. I was, like, oh, it's like underwhelming compared to what you knew when you saw it at its peak. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like Be Beijing probably as my first one was the like the the best experience of it uh, of what the, that that I've been to. Having said that, you know, um, the World Championships in Rome for all of the controversy that surrounded it around suits was an unbelievable event yeah, uh, it, it was it, it was outdoor wasn't it it was yeah. it was unbelievably one. hot <laughs> yeah. oh it was i remember i remember i only raced there on i think the the first or second day and so after that i was team cheerleader with with a couple of others and we were sort of handed the task of basically going and reserving the seats for for the british team uh, to spectate ready for finals in the evening I remember having to try and like 
sit on these seats and just grin and bear the, the heat on the plastic seats because it was so incredibly hot just to be able to do as many as we could. But it was, um, yeah, the last yeah. outdoor meet, wasn't it? The last major outdoor meet yes. place, which was uh, yeah. exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. But the, the way they set that arena up as well was, was fantastic, wasn't it? it was, yeah. the, the crowd was huge for their sun shining every single day. Swimming was fast as anything. There was some mad racing, whether it's for good and bad. I mean, it's like one of the events stands out to me. It doesn't even feature a British swimmer, but it was the women's 200 breaststroke. I think Rebecca Sony was winning by five metres uh, after 150 metres. And yeah. yeah, the wheels came off. And yeah, I Remember mean, brave as anything for her to do what she did, but it didn't come off. And then you had. Oh, I think the men's 800, uh, Biedemann broke Thorpe's world record. Yeah, that was great. Every, every, virtually every world record went in. <laughs> yes, there was the controversy of the suits, but hey, it, it was still a good event. It was still yeah, a good event. Yeah, but it was event. fun to be part of, weren't it? Fun to see that. The, uh, yeah. Every race, you were like, what's going to happen next? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it, was, it, it was mad, wasn't it? It was, yeah, it was mad, yeah. really, to, to some extent. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember I remember preparation wise for that though. I remember the food at the hotel um not being great. I remember everyone sort of struggling with that. The, the hotel not being great. No, yeah. The, the hotel don't... wasn't good at all, was it? Compared oh, was to it? your uh, your life in uh, Brazil by the sounds of it. <laughs> personal yeah. lessons there. Eh? <laughs> who, who went to the Commonwealth in twenty ten? Yeah. You in. We yeah. both did. Both yeah. were. Yeah. Do you remember the, the hotel in Doha? Oh, that was phenomenal. Yeah. That's was, yeah. That was the best hotel I've ever been in in my life. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turn down service and things. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, yeah. To the yeah. village in Delhi, yeah. we're just like, <laughs> I don't know why they did it. made it look even like yeah. Russia in Delhi. Yeah. All part of the fun, huh? where, where it was the complete opposite with um, um, Rome, wasn't it? I mean, in Rome, the hotel was like, not great. The food was awful. Um, we, but we, we, you just had to get on with it, and that's that yeah. is the thing. You, you can't control everything that's going on, and you've you've got to you've got to. There's no good whinging about anything. Um, there was times that I, actually, because um, Joanne had a really busy program in Rome, really busy, and yeah. there was times that really she'd get back and there'd be virtually no food left. Not oh. that it was you'd really want to eat it, but there's times she she get back. You know, because she, she won three medals there. So she's getting drug tested all the time as well. Um, doing pr press conferences and stuff. She got back from there really late some nights and was like, just eat what you can. It's all, all right, I've got stuff up my room. And that's how we have to be, isn't it? We've got to be prepared the best we can be, but also just roll with the punches and don't let things affect you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, everyone still got performances there so you know it's yeah <laughs> yeah like you say control the controllables as best you can but i mean now you, yeah. you kind of um come off poolside a little bit now and you've got a bit of a different role so can you tell us a little bit about what it is that you do now yeah so i'm i'm still with british women obviously uh i am pathway manager so pathway being the transfer of young athletes up to, up to seniors so, you know, I, I work with athletes and their coaches to try to make sure that we can get as many of the people that we are identifying at young ages through and feeding up to the senior team. Trying to make sure that there's a good supply of swimmers going into the senior team with the right type of attributes, the right skills, the right, uh, and, and not just skills as in what they are in the pool, but the right, right mentality and skills and right level of experience um to, to go forward i guess another big bit of that job is um i do do uh kind of project work as well so british women have a an educational portal called off the blocks and that has just anything educational that we have gets goes on there and that's that that's kind of my domain that's that's something that i have to make sure is got stuff going on on there virtually every week um 
so that that that's one of those things and yeah various other things i i do bits of analysis to look at what's important and what's not important trying to figure out like along with tom shaw and uh leah uh we we try to like look at data and analyze data to look at what trends are and what trends are important um You've always got to, like, if you're designing a system, I guess you have to go with what the weight of evidence is, but you've got to, like, allow for, there'll always be some outliers, and systems have to allow outliers to thrive, but you've got to try to come up with something that gets as many as possible through as well. Brilliant. So, um, is Portal um, something that can be accessed by uh, everybody, all young swimmers, or do you have to be on one of these pathways to be able to access these? No, no, we. we the, 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 it's got 9,000 people uh, wow. that are registered on it. You, the only stipulation is you have to be British. It started off as a coaching resource for more uh, the assistant coaches and guys that were coaching probably 14 and under. But right. it, it is in the time I've been doing this job, it has grown into something much, much bigger now. It's got a... Now, there's, there's thousands of coaches on there. There's a few hundred parents that are, are signed up to it now. There are a few hundred swimmers that have signed up to it. Um, we've, uh, we, we produced a and launched in the back end of 2018 a, a, a development framework for swimming. Okay. And it's, uh, it, that, that sits on, the, the, on here as well. Basically, this development framework, we'll, it, it's mainly, it's not actually the what you need to do in the pool. There's very little of that within this development framework. Mainly it is what, what, how do we need to be as people and uh, what attributes do we need? Um, and then uh, what I, I try to think how many things there is. There's probably 60 attributes I identified within the development framework and from world-class athletes that has done a video that talks about each and every one of them attributes and what it means to them. So Adam's done, Adam P's done some, yeah. uh, right down to Tom Dean doing stuff, Fred Anderson. So all these videos are hosted on there as well. It's a great resource. Everybody that does come on to it thinks it's a good resource. You just, there's a registration page. Um, you, 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 you kind of fill in um, and uh, we, we, Leah administers, administers it. And she actually just has to check that you are in Britain. Right, okay. <laughs> Anyone that's from outside Britain is like, uh, no, no, no. So, <laughs> Our <yeah>. secrets. <laughs> it's a British site for the benefit of British coaches, British swimmers, uh, and British sports staff. There's, you know, we've, we've got a lot of officials, actually, that are registered on, on it as well, and, and swimming teachers as well. So it's about 9,500 people, I think, that are, are registered on the site. And there's some something since September we've managed to get something on there every week, something new every single week since September. So we're, we're doing pretty well on that at, at, at the minute in keeping new, fresh stuff there. Really? Yeah, I have had a, sorry, have had a look on it at points, and um, yeah, there's some great stuff going up. There's loads of it, like you say as well. So that's great. But um, I mean, what are you really enjoying this changing role? Because obviously it's of you using your experience as a coach to carry into this role um do you do you enjoy the change kind of coming off poolside or do you miss poolside a little bit or um well i do obviously i keep getting the, uh, the opportunity to go back on deck and like most of our junior teams uh, um well nearly all junior teams i, I am is still involved with them in a, in a coaching capacity so i was head coach for european juniors um last July, end of June, beginning of July. Um, when we take development teams off anywhere, uh, uh, it's just the right thing that we, they, unless we like kind of, somebody's at a level where they've done an event, done an event, done an event as an assistant coach. And, okay, let's let's see where they sit and how they will do as, an, as a head coach. Now, uh, generally I, I'm on teams as uh, with, with the, in the youth program as, as a as a coach i do miss it i mean i do do miss it to some extent but i can't i can't ever see myself going uh going back on deck the bit that i love is things i mean i i do love talking uh swimming talking coaching uh, that yeah. might have come across here <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a passion 
absolutely and and um so so i do love it but i also love love like working with athletes was great and yeah i i miss that to to, to some extent um but uh I like working with coaches, and, I, and at the minute, it's, that is a big part of what I'm doing is work, working with coaches. I also link with Swim England as well. There's a, there's a portion of my salaries paid for by Swim England, so I'm the link between British Swimming and Swim England, um, and uh, I do, I'm heavily involved in all their coach development initiatives that they do, and you know, I, I do a lot of work in setting up coaching symposiums and coaching workshops and stuff like that with them. Uh, so they, they they are really good, exciting things for me to be involved in. Oh, bro! Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, how with obviously um, government government announcement that pools won't be opening um, at the next stage of lockdown uh, easing. Does that change? And I mean, you're still busy, I presume, doing your job day to day at the moment. Um, does it have yeah. anything in the way you can do things within your role now? Oh yeah, I mean I'm pretty, yeah. I mean, fifty percent or more of my role was driving around the country, visiting programs, and uh, talking to coaches, like you know, face to face, talking to swimmers face to face. And now everything's from home. Um, there's, there's, I try to keep with in touch with as many coaches as I can. I have I've got two different like kind of email groups of coaches. One that's got about thirty guys on, and one that's got hundred and forty on and I try to keep uh, keep keep in touch with them pretty regularly. Uh, the 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 off the blocks site it is a uh, you know we, we are trying to push really hard to build up a, uh, a a decent volume of stuff that can then go on in the coming months. You now we so we we're, we're just storing it at the minute. We we're building up a, a library that'll just get tr- get fed on over a period of time because so once things are back up and running uh, fully it's that site is actually the hardest thing to keep fresh um because everybody is you know then just concentrating on the hit not always on the here and now but they've got got the job to do of of getting swimmers to swim fast (laughs) yeah Yeah. so it's a very different way of working right now yeah. Do you think once the like you know things are all back to normal, hopefully whatever normal is going to look like, you will go back to the way you were, or will you take something away from the way you've been doing things now, like over Zoom, emails, phone? Will you be able to come off visiting the whole country all the time, or is that face to face still the most important thing? I think the face to face is most important, but one of the things it'll definitely do is I think with the whole coach development, coach education side. We've learned that Zoom can, you know, why, why drag people up from Plymouth down from Aberdeen to Loughborough to do a development session when you can do it on Zoom? I, and I think that's not just in the swimming industry. That's, yeah, I think yeah. a lot, a hell of a lot of business and industry is going to be now realised, I, I can do this differently. Yeah, yeah. That's good, yeah. I mean, you've got to find some positives out of this situation, aren't you? If there's a silver lining, then... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, but but you know, it, like I said, it is really important to to have face to face contact with uh, swimmers and coaches as well. Um, yeah, yeah, and and I don't want to do oh. a Zoom. I don't want to see how they're training on Zoom though. You know, I don't I don't <laughs> want someone sticking a laptop on a, on pool deck and like you yeah, there you can watch what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't <laughs> I still that. do like being on deck. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> and like you said before, it's about those relationships, isn't it? Like you say, you got to know your own athletes, and you got to get to know those coaches and those developing athletes, so they know you and they can feel comfortable talking to you. And stuff. Yeah, and uh, it's great to hear that you're enjoying your new role and that you're you're giving back to what you can, your roots, essentially getting back into that age group uh, development level. That's that's perfect role for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's kind of like gone. Yeah, gone gone full circle for me. So I I have operated at virtually every every level of the sport. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. And your your passion for it's definitely come through today. So I mean, thanks so much for speaking with us, Kev. It's been really really lovely to kind of find out more about about you about your your 
you know, your career as a coach and philosophies and everything like that. So best of luck with your role now and really hope Paul's get back to it soon. And um, yeah, thanks again, Kev. It's nice to speak with you. Yeah, it's been great. Really, really enjoyed it and great seeing you too. Hopefully it'll not be too long that we can get face to face. Yeah, hopefully, yeah, (laughs) definitely. A a little social event. (laughs) (laughs) Very nice, Kev. Thank you very much, mate. Thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Kev. See you soon. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Thanks to Kev for being our guest today. We really hope you all enjoyed the episode and hope to see you next time.